Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This is a talk called The Return to Our Primordial Nature. The last 150 years in Europe have seen the breaking away of society from religious structures, religious thought and a religious way of being. Conflating the teachings of the prophets with the authority of priests, Europe has sought to liberate itself not only from religious structures, but from the divine itself. Man has cut himself free of God, it would seem, and thus catapulted himself into what he calls existence. He has felt the intoxication of being able to challenge, question and deconstruct, of being able to say no. Thus he has found himself in a kind of permanent adolescence, where the pinnacle of human development is a triumphant defiance against all that is apparently oppressive. So man has come up with questions and a way of life that revolves around challenging and defying, and in addition to that, experimenting and exploring free of all apparent restrictions, enjoying the intoxication of breaking boundaries. But what man has not come up with is answers. And while in the 20th century he may have attempted to move beyond the stage of deconstruction, he has struggled to come up with any effective means of reconstruction and restoration. He has cut himself free and drifted into the wide open wastelands of existence, and he has tasted existence up to a point. He tasted everything that man might like to taste, all kinds of power, different fashions, different moral boundaries, different relationships, different lifestyles. And he became very sophisticated too, experimenting with art that asks questions, experimenting with literature that asks questions, experimenting with film that asks questions. And when he discovered that he couldn't find any clear answers, he began to scoff at the desire for clarity and when he became depressed, he didn't let it show. Nevertheless, in his sophisticated way, he produced art that reflected his sense of loss, emptiness and confusion, and literature that commented on our dysfunctional, dystopic lives, and film that expressed our ultimate alienation from ourselves. After the intoxication of being free to run around in the open wastelands of existence, comes the sobriety of realizing that existence in itself is just existence. It has nothing to say to us for all its color and entertainment. Both Nietzsche and Heidegger attempted to build some kind of philosophical edifice that told us how wonderful existence is and how our truth can be revealed through it in an everlasting journey. And that's what it's all about. But when compared to the mystical praxis of the prophets, these philosophical constructions look like mere hypotheses, and hypotheses which still fail to provide the real answer. What ultimately is the truth? Should we be satisfied with being told that it's an ongoing journey to find out? Because that's the point that the philosophers of our time have reached. Well, we don't really know, but hey, enjoy the journey. And our daily lives reflect this philosophy. Well, we don't really know why we're living our lives, but hey, let's just carry on living them anyway. And we could say that this emptiness and pointlessness lies at the heart of much of European culture as it is today. It's better and safer not to ask questions anymore. With regard to the women of our age, it can't be denied that they have had real battles to fight. The fight to be seen as having the intelligence to participate in politics. The fight to be able to go to university and to exercise our talents to the best of our ability. Many people these days hark back to a supposedly golden age in the 1950s. But that was also an age where women who were seen as morally deviant were put away in asylums. There can be no doubt that women have had to fight against different kinds of oppression. 
but with the throwing off of certain patriarchal shackles and narrow, shallow interpretations of the prophetic path, and again with the intoxication that has come with that, women have moved out into the open wastelands of existence, an existence whose sacred dimensions have all but disappeared. Women have become economic beings in their scramble to excel in the workplace, and sexual beings in the primeval scramble to find a mate. In a capitalist, individualistic society, they are encouraged to compete with each other in everything. Women have become ruthless with each other in their battle to find the truth of their existence within the limits of this existence. Interestingly, with my generation, there is now a turnaround. Women are exhausted. The intoxication of breaking free of boundaries has passed and they find themselves faced with the rather mundane challenge of providing for the family as men used to do. Just last week, I read an article by a woman who goes out to work and she works long hours to support the family while her husband stays at home and looks after their baby girl. She says, I am caught in the age-old male trap of seeing every penny I earn factored away into future nursery fees, roof repairs and supermarket bills and wondering why I bother. She expresses regret at having to rebuild the bond that gets strained by the end of a long week away from her daughter and she says perhaps this is how working fathers felt all along but there is one inescapable conclusion. It is what we feminists fought for, the right to do as men do. Be careful what you wish for. I'm not saying that a woman's place is in the kitchen, but rather what I learned about my culture as I grew up and was able to reflect back upon it is that as people in European countries have become supposedly more sophisticated and advanced, they have at the same time moved further and further away from their primordial, even cosmic way of being. We have become obsessed with the world and with our place in it. That is, with our place in it as individuals, and we have utterly forgotten that there is a deeper and more comprehensive aspect to our being, and a deeper and more beautiful purpose to our being here. Western women look pityingly at supposedly unsophisticated Muslim women who have not gone through the whole process of deconstruction. Muslim women appear to be still stuck in an age that Western women have proudly glided past, even if these very same Western women now find themselves out on a limb, stuck in a state of existential anxiety. It is rare for contemporary post-industrial societies to see women as spiritual beings. While women of previous generations have reacted perhaps to a dry, restrictive morality of the 1950s, women of later generations are finding that they are having to reconstruct themselves after everything has been taken apart, and this may take perhaps 15 or 20 years of battling to find their way out of the chaos. Atheists may sneer at the desire for certainty, but let's replace certainty with clarity. Who wants to live without clarity, without comprehension of oneself? While my upbringing was very much with the thinking that religion is irrelevant to one's life, I never stopped intuitively sensing that there is a transcendent entity that lies beyond the phenomenal world, and I actually used to listen for guidance, even though it never occurred to me to actively ask for guidance. I have always instinctively felt that my consciousness is connected to that transcendent entity and that my life needs to be lived in harmony with it. The way of life, at least in this country, United Kingdom, is distinctly out of sync with that. When I discovered Islam, I also found very much a vibrant, living, initiatic tradition which re resonates with the energy or light, you could say, and the clarity of coming from the one and leading back to the one. And it dawned on me how much more logical it was to place the one absolute existence at the heart of one's life, to make that the foundation and pinnacle of one's life, rather than just think about it sometimes and go off in all different directions at other times. The path began when I placed the one at the heart of my life, the axis or the qutb 
around which everything else revolves. Not only is this a living and ever unfolding path back to the divine, a path of ever unfolding light and clarity, rather than a path of guesswork and relativism, it is also something that lifted me out of the matrix of an apparently advanced, sophisticated society which is nevertheless virtually illiterate when it comes to matters of the soul and of the consciousness. The secular way of being is not, to my mind, the pinnacle of perfection for which we should be aiming. It is simply too shallow and incomplete. What Islam teaches about how to be as a human being and how to be as a woman is probably the opposite of what young women are taught in our society. Young women are taught that if you exploit yourself and know how to sell yourself, then you will be succeed, then you will succeed and be loved too. This is nothing but a lie, and I am not the only one to have called it so. Women go out of their way to exploit themselves in the hope of success and love, and while they may benefit the men in this society with their self-exploitation, they rarely benefit themselves. Success and love may or may not materialize, or if it does, at what cost to oneself? Islam teaches what today would be seen as outdated values, but they are values that cut across all ways of life that cultivate the soul and actually are perennial. These are very simple things such as protect your soul, guard yourself against evil, value your dignity, be chaste, in short, it teaches the opposite of self-exploitation to the world. Woman is a spiritual being, a soul that is journeying through this world to a destined end, the abode of wisdom in proximity to the divine. Our objective in this world is to know our own souls, to be at peace with ourselves, to aspire to gain knowledge and to be people of knowledge. Islam teaches us to cultivate beauty of the soul, this goes for both men and women. We are striving to create a beautiful world where it is the essence of ourselves that shines. This means that we do away with fakeness within ourselves. The way of being for many women around the world who follow the post-industrial Western model is something which involves a self-conscious artificial construction. How many women call their makeup war paint and feel that they need to apply it to go out and face the world. Islam is about stripping away artifice. It is about being on the outside what you are on the inside, and not colluding with falsehood. It is about being free-spirited, without having to compromise yourself or expose yourself to the market. I don't look at the leading female figures in Islamic history in isolation. A key part of their being women was their place in their society and how they related to the men of that society. What we see in early Islamic history is not women competing with men, but cooperating with men and vice versa. Everybody was working towards the same goal, establishing a way of life that places cultivation of the soul at the centre. Thus, there was mutual assistance among men and women. This can be seen on the battlefields where the women aided men who had been wounded or where women actually themselves fought. This can also be seen in the manners, adab, akhlaq, or codes of etiquette that were instilled by the Holy Prophet and his purified progeny, his daughter Fatima, and the imams who came after her. One simple example is the loving relationship that existed between Lady Fatima and the Holy Prophet in a society where it was seen as unmanly even for one to have daughters in one's family. She was called Um Abiha, the mother of her father. And he used to get up for her when she entered the room and offer his place for her to sit. We don't even see such respect shown to a daughter by fathers in sophisticated, industrialized societies. In the tradition of the followers of the holy household of the prophet, Fatima was more than the daughter of the Holy Prophet. She was a being who was born in heavenly circumstances, who had about her the scent of paradise, who transmitted the esoteric knowledge of the religion down through her purified progeny. She is the mother of the divinely selected leaders who came after her father. 
The Imams said to their followers that we are a proof over you and Fatima is a proof over us. We can see the respect shown to women in the Imam's choice of wives too. Many of them were women who served in the household of the Imam, who were seen as having the stature and nobility of character to bear the weighty responsibility of being the mother of the next Imam. The issue of covering with a scarf or dressing modestly has been turned into something controversial by the media. It is amazing how it provokes such extreme reactions. Covering does have many dimensions to it, and one cannot say that women wear it for all the same reasons. My turning back to a primordial way of being has included an inward connection. The inner nurturing of the soul is facilitated by establishing a gentle outward barrier against the market of the world. Western women have tried to find other such barriers, as I said, the wearing of war paint or sharp masculine suits. I myself, in my struggle to be treated with respect in the workplace in my 20s and on the street, found that wearing a pinstripe suit was quite effective. But then why should I have to dispense with my femininity in order to survive? Women have asked me why I conceal my femininity with a scarf, but I find on the contrary that hijab is very feminine. It definitely marks a woman out from a man, and ironically, this is what often displeases some Western feminists too. Hijab is a smart feminine garment that transcends materialistic corporate culture. Covering is archetypal. It is part of going back to the primordial self. The primordial self is connected to and integrated with the sacred dimensions of the creation. The Muslim woman is a reminder in a desacralized world of the sacred dimensions of being and of that divine transcendent entity that brought existence into being as a way of knowing it and as a means back to it. She is on an internal journey to the infinite that will continue to unfold in pathways of light long after she has left this world.